Section 1 of Speeches of Prince Bismarck, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Speeches of Prince Bismarck, Part 1, by Otto von Bismarck. Translated by Edmund von Mark. Professorial Politics, December 21st, 1863. Translated by Edmund von Mark. Ph.D. In the Prussian Diet, the representative, Johann Ludwig Telkampf, professor of economics and political science in the University of Breslau, had attacked the policy of Bismarck in regard to Schleswig-Holstein. Bismarck replied as follows. The conception which the previous speaker has of the politics of Europe reminds me of a man from the plains who is on his first journey to the mountains. When he sees a huge elevation loom up before him, nothing seems easier than to climb it. He does not even think that he will need a guide, for the mountain is in plain sight, and the road to it apparently without obstacles. But when he starts, he soon comes upon ravines and crevasses, which not even the best of speeches will help him to cross. The gentleman comforted us concerning similar obstacles in the path of politics by saying things like these. It is well known that Russia can do nothing at present. It does not appear that Austria will take a contrary step. England knows very well that her interests are counselling peace. And, finally, France will not act against her national principles. If we should believe these assurances, and think more highly of the estimate which the gentleman has made of the politics of Europe than our own official judgment, and should thereby drive Prussia to an isolated and humiliating position, could we then excuse ourselves by saying, We could see the danger coming, but we trusted the speaker, thinking, he knew probably more than we. If this is impossible, how can we attach to the remarks of the speaker the weight which he wishes us to attach to them? For all official positions, those of judges, for instance, and even those of subalterns in the army, we require examinations and a practical knowledge, difficult examinations, but high politics, oh, anyone can practice them who feels himself called upon to do so. Nothing is easier than to make endless assertions in this field of conjectures and to cast caution to the winds. You know that one must write a whole book to controvert one erroneous thought, and he who voiced the error remains unconvinced. It is a dangerous and far-spread mistake which assumes that a naive intuition will reveal to the political dilettante what remains hidden from the wisdom of the expert. Professor Telkampf replied in great excitement, My whole life as a professor of political science has been devoted to the study of politics and I should like to ask the president of the ministry whether he knew more of political science when he began his political career as a dykemaster than a professor of this science knows. To which Bismarck replied, I do not at all deny the familiarity of the previous speaker with political theories, but he has wandered from the field of theory into that of practice. He has announced with complete assurance, to me and to this assembly, what each European cabinet will probably do in this concrete case. These are the very things which I believe I must know better than he. This belief I have expressed. The previous speaker has referred to his activity in theoretical politics as a professor through many years. If the gentleman had served even one year in practical politics, possibly as a bureau chief in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he would not have said what he said today from the Speaker's desk. 
and his advice, after this one year of practical training, would be of greater value to me than if he had been active for even more years than he says as a professor on the lecture platform. End of section one. Read by Alistair, Melbourne, 6th of February, 2023. Section 2 of Speeches of Prince Bismarck, Part 1, by Otto von Bismarck, translated by Edmund von Mark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Speech from the Throne, written by Bismarck and delivered by William I, July 19th, 1870, translated by Edmund von Mark, Ph.D. Disturbed by the increasing bonds of union between the northern and southern German states, in which France saw a lessening of her own prestige across the Rhine, the ministers of Napoleon III had decided on war against Prussia. They found a pretext in the candidacy of a Hohenzollern prince for the throne of Spain. Contrary to diplomatic usage, they requested the king of Prussia to force the withdrawal of the prince and even when the father of the prince announced the withdrawal of his son, they were not satisfied, but instructed Benedetti, the French ambassador, to secure from the king of Prussia a humiliating promise for the future. The king indignantly refused, and Bismarck published the occurrence in the famous Dispatch of Ems, July 13th, 1870. Thereupon, the French cabinet declared war on July 15th, 1870. The formal notice was served on Bismarck July 19th, and on the same day the King of Prussia opened a special session of the Reichstag with the following address, which had been prepared by Bismarck. Gentlemen of the Reichstag of the North German Federation, when I welcomed you here at your last assembly, it was with joy and gratitude, because God had crowned my efforts with success. I could announce to you that every disturbance of the peace had been avoided. In response to the wishes of the people and the demands of civilization. If now the Allied governments have been compelled by threats of war and its danger to summon you to a special session, you will not feel less convinced than we that it was the wish of the North German Federation to develop the forces of the German people as a support of universal peace and not as a possible source of danger to it. <clears throat> if we call upon these forces today for the protection of our independence, we are doing nothing but what honour and duty demand. The candidacy of a German prince for the Spanish throne, with which Allied governments had nothing to do, neither when it was pressed nor when it was withdrawn, and which interested the North German Federation only in so far as the government of a friendly nation seemed to expect of it the assurance of a peaceful and orderly government for its much harassed land. This candidacy offered to the Emperor of the French the pretense of seeing in it a cause for war, contrary to the long-established custom of diplomacy. When the pretense no longer existed, he kept to his views in utter disregard for the rights which our people have to the blessings of peace, views which find their analogy in the history of the former rulers of France. When, in earlier centuries, Germany suffered in silence such attacks on her rights and her honour, she did so because she was divided and did not know her strength. Today, when the bonds of the spiritual and political union, which began with the War of Liberation, are knitting the German races 
more closely together as time advances, and when our armour no longer offers an opening to the enemy, Germany carries in her bosom the will and strength to defend herself against renewed French violence. It is not presumption which dictates these words. The Allied governments, and I myself, we are fully conscious of the fact that victory and defeat rest with the Lord of Battles. We have measured with clear vision the responsibility which attaches before God and men to him who drives two peace-loving peoples in the heart of Europe to war. The German and French people, enjoying in equal measure the blessings of Christian morals and of growing prosperity, are meant for a more wholesome contest than the bloody contest of war. The rulers of France, however, have known how to exploit by calculated deception the just though excitable, pride of the French nation in furtherance of their own interests and for the gratification of their own passions. The more conscious the Allied governments are of having done everything permitted by their honour and their dignity to preserve for Europe the blessings of peace, and the more apparent it is to everybody the sword has been forced upon us. The greater is the confidence with which we rely on the unanimous decision of the German governments of the South as well as the North, and appeal to the patriotism and self-sacrifice of the German people, calling them to the defence of their honour and their independence. We shall fight, as our fathers did, against the violence of foreign conquerors, and for our freedom and our right. And in this fight, in which we have no other aim than securing for Europe lasting peace, God will be with us as he was with our fathers. End of section two. Read by Alistair. Melbourne, 28th of February, 2023. Section 3 of Speeches of Prince Bismarck, Part 1, by Otto von Bismarck, translated by Edmund von Mark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Alsace-Lorraine, a glasses against France, May 2nd, 1871. Translated by Edmund von Mack, Ph.D. After the war, France had been obliged to return to Germany the two provinces, Alsace and Lorraine, which she had attached to herself in times of Germany's weakness. It might have been better to unite these provinces with one of the German states, but it was feared that so valuable an increase in territory of one of the 25 states that had just been federated in the empire might lead to renewed dissension. The suggestion, therefore, was made to administer the two provinces for the present as common property, and to leave the final arrangements to the future. A bill concerning the immediate disposition of Alsace and Lorraine was submitted to the Reichstag on May 2nd, 1871, when Prince Bismarck opened the discussion with the following speech. In introducing the pending bill, I shall have to say only a few words, for the debate will offer me the opportunity of elucidating the various details. The underlining principles are, I believe, not subject to a difference of opinion. I mean the question whether Alsace and Lorraine should be incorporated in the German Empire. The form in which this should be done, and especially what steps should first be taken, will be the subject of your deliberations. You will, moreover, find the Allied governments ready to weigh carefully all suggestions different from our own, which may be made in this connection. I believe that there will be no difference of opinion 
concerning the principle itself, because there was none a year ago, nor has any appeared during this year of war. If we imagine ourselves back one year, or more accurately, ten months, we can say to ourselves that all Germany was agreed in her love of peace. There was not a German who did not wish to be at peace with France as long as this was honourably possible. Those morbid exceptions, which possibly desired war in hope of seeing their own country defeated, they are not worthy of their name. I do not count them among the Germans. I insist the Germans were unanimous in their desire for peace. But when war was forced upon them, and they were compelled to take arms, then the Germans were fully as unanimous in their determination to look for assurances against the likelihood of another similar war, provided God were to give them the victory in this one, which they were resolved to wage manfully. If, however, another such war should occur in the future, they intended to see to it now that our defence would be easier. Everyone remembers that there probably had not been a generation of our fathers for three hundred years which had not been forced to draw the sword against France, and everyone knew the reason why Germany had previously missed the opportunity of securing for herself a better protection against an attack from the West even at those times when she happened to be among the conquerors of France. It was because the victories had been won in the company with allies whose interests were not ours. Everybody, therefore, was determined, if we should conquer this time independently and solely by our own might and right, we should strive to make the future more secure for our children. In the course of centuries, the wars against France had resulted almost always to our disadvantage, because Germany had been divided. This had created a geographical and strategic frontier, which was full of temptations for France and of menace for Germany. I cannot describe our condition before the last war, and especially that of South Germany, more strikingly than with the words of a thoughtful South German sovereign. When Germany was urged to take the part of the Western powers in the Oriental War, although her governments were not convinced that this was in their interest, this sovereign, there is no reason why I should not name him, it was the late King William of Württemberg, said to me, <clears throat> I share your view that we have no call to mix in this war, and that no German interests are at stake of sufficient worth to spill a drop of German blood for them. But what will happen if we should quarrel with the Western powers on this account? You may count on my vote in the Bundestag until the war is at hand. Then conditions will be altered. I am as ready as the next man to fulfil my obligations, but take care lest you judge people differently from what they are. Give us Strasbourg, and we shall be with you at all hazards. As long as Strasbourg is a sally port for an ever armed force, I must fear that my country will be inundated by foreign troops before the North German alliance can come to my assistance. Personally, I shall not hesitate a moment to eat the hard bread of exile in your camp, but my people, weighed down by contributions, will write to me urging a change of policy upon me. I do not know what I shall do, nor whether all will remain sufficiently firm. The crux of the situation is Strasbourg, for as long as it is not German, it will prevent South Germany from giving herself unreservedly to German unity and to a national German policy. 
As long as Strasbourg is a sally port for an ever-ready army of from 100,000 to 150,000 men, Germany will find herself unable to appear on the Upper Rhine with an equally large army on time. The French will always be here first. <clears throat> I believe this instance, taken from an actual occurrence, says everything. I need not add one word. The wedge which Alsace pushed into Germany near Weisenberg separated South Germany from North Germany more effectively than the political line of the main. It needed a high degree of determination, national enthusiasm, and devotion for our South German allies not to hesitate one moment but to identify the danger of North Germany with their own, and to advance boldly in our company, in spite of that other danger, in their immediate proximity, to which a clever conduct of the war on the part of France would have exposed them, that France, in her superior position, had been ready to yield to the temptation which this advanced outpost of Strasbourg offered her against Germany whenever her internal affairs made an excursion into foreign land desirable, we have seen for many decades. It is well known that the French ambassador entered my office as late as August 6th, 1866, with a briefly worded ultimatum, either cede to France the city of Mayence or expect an immediate declaration of war. I was, of course, not one moment in doubt about my reply. I said to him, Well then, it is war. He proceeded with this reply to Paris. There they changed their mind after a few days, and I was given to understand that this instruction had been wrung from Emperor Napoleon during an attack of illness. The further attempts on Luxembourg and the consequent issues are known to you. I will not revert to them, nor do I believe that it is necessary to prove that France did not always show a sufficiently strong character to resist the temptations which the possession of Alsace brought with it. The question was how to secure a guarantee against this. It had to be of a territorial nature, because the guarantees of foreign powers were not of much use to us, such guarantees having at times been subject to supplementary and attenuating declarations. One might have thought that all Europe would have felt the need of preventing the ever-occurring wars of two great and civilised peoples in the heart of Europe and that it would have been natural to assume that the simplest way to do this was to strengthen the defences of that one of the two participants, who was doubtless the more pacific. I cannot, however, say that at first this idea appeared convincing everywhere. Other expedients were looked for, and the suggestion was often made that we should be satisfied with an indemnity and the raising of the French fortresses in Alsace and Lorraine. This I always opposed, because I considered it an impracticable means of maintaining peace. The establishment of an easement on foreign territory is very oppressive and disagreeable to the sense of sovereignty and independence of those who are affected by it. The cession of a fortress is felt scarcely more bitterly than the injunction by foreigners not to build on territory which is under one's own sovereignty. French passions have probably been excited more frequently and more successfully by a reference to the raising of that unimportant place of Huningen than by the loss of any conquered territory which France had to suffer in 1815. I placed, therefore, no confidence in this means, especially since the geographical configuration of this advanced outpost, as I took the liberty of calling it, would have put the starting place for the French troops just as near to Stuttgart and Munich 
as it had always been. It was important to put it farther back. Metz, moreover, is a place of such topographical configuration that very little art is needed to transform it into a strong fortress. If anyone should destroy these additions to nature, which would be a very expensive undertaking, they could be quickly restored. Consequently, I looked upon this suggestion as insufficient. There might have been one other means, and one which the inhabitants of Alsace and Lorraine favoured, of founding a neutral territory similar to Belgium and Switzerland. There would have been a chain of neutral states from the North Sea to the Swiss Alps, which would have made it impossible for us to attack France by land, because we are accustomed to respect treaties and neutrality, and because we should have been separated from France by this strip of land between us. France would have received a protecting armour against us, but nothing would have prevented her from occasionally sending her fleet with troops to our coast, a plan she had under consideration during the last war, although she did not execute it, or from landing her armies with her allies and entering Germany from there. France would have received a protecting armour against us, but we should have been without protection by sea as long as our navy did not equal the French. This was one objection, although one of only secondary importance. The chief reason was that neutrality can only be maintained when the inhabitants are determined to preserve an independent and neutral position, and to defend it by the force of arms if need be. That is what both Belgium and Switzerland have done. As far as we were concerned in the last war, no action on their part would have been necessary. But it is a fact that both countries have maintained their neutrality. Both are determined to remain neutral commonwealths. This supposition would not have been true in the immediate future for the neutrality newly to be established in Alsace and Lorraine. On the contrary, it is to be expected that the strong French elements, which are going to survive in the country for a long while, and whose interests, sympathies, and memories are connected with France, would have induced the people to unite with France in the case of another Franco-German war, no matter who their sovereign might be. The neutrality of Alsace-Lorraine, therefore, would have been merely a sham, harmful to us and helpful to France. Nothing was left, therefore, but to bring these countries, with their strong fortresses, completely under German control. It was our purpose to establish them as a powerful glacis in Germany's defence against France, and to move the starting point of a possible French attack several days' marches farther back. If France, having regained her strength or won allies, should again throw down the gauntlet to us. The chief obstacle to the realisation of this idea, which was to satisfy the incontestable demands of our safety, was found in the opposition of the inhabitants themselves, who did not wish to be separated from France. It is not my duty here to inquire into the causes which made it possible for a thoroughly German community to become so deeply attached to a country speaking a different tongue and possessing a government which was not always kind and considerate. To a great extent this may have been due to the fact that all those qualities which distinguish Germans from the French 
are found to such a high degree in Alsace-Lorraine, that the inhabitants of this country formed, I may say it without fear of seeming presumption, an aristocracy in France as regards proficiency and exactness. They were better qualified for service and more reliable in office. The substitutes in the army, the gendarmes and the civil officers, were from Alsace-Lorraine, in numbers entirely out of proportion to the population of these provinces. There were one and a half million Germans, who knew how to make use of these virtues, among a people who have other virtues, but are lacking in these particular ones. Thanks to their excellence, they enjoyed a favoured position which made them unmindful of many legal iniquities. It is, moreover, characteristic of the Germans that every tribe lays claim to some superiority, especially over its immediate neighbours. As long as the people of Alsace and Lorraine were French, Paris with its splendour and the grandeur of a united France stood behind them and they could meet their fellow Germans with a consciousness that Paris was theirs, and thus find a reason for their sense of exclusive superiority. I do not wish to discuss further the reasons why everyone attaches himself more readily to a big political system which gives scope to his abilities, than to a divided, albeit related, nation, such as existed formerly on this side of the Rhine in so far as the Alsatians were concerned. The fact is, such disinclination existed, and that it is our duty to overcome it by patience. We have, it seems to me, many means at our disposal. We Germans are accustomed to govern more benevolently, sometimes more awkwardly, but in the long run, really more benevolently and humanely than the French statesmen. This is a merit of the German character which will soon appeal to the Alsatian heart and become manifest. We are, moreover, able to grant the inhabitants a far greater degree of communal and individual freedom than the French institutions and traditions ever permitted. If we watch the present movement in Paris, the Commune, we shall find what is true of every movement possessing the least endurance that it contains at bottom a grain of sense, in spite of all the unreasonable motives which attach to it, influencing its individual partisans. Without this, no movement can attain even that degree of force which the Commune exercises at present. This grain of sense, I do not know how many people believe in it, but surely the most intelligent and best who at present are fighting against their countrymen do believe in it, is, to put it briefly, the German municipal government. If the commune possessed this, then the better element of its supporters, I do not say all, would be satisfied. We must differentiate according to the facts. The militia of the usurpers consists largely of people who have nothing to lose. There are, in a city of two million inhabitants, many so-called repris de justice, or as we should say, people under police supervision, who are spending in Paris the interval between two terms in prison. They are congregating in the city in considerable numbers, and are ready to serve disorder and pillage wherever it may be. It is these people who gave the movement before we had scrutinized its theoretical aims, the occasional prominent character which seemed to threaten civilization, and which, in the interests of humanity, I now hope has been overcome. It is, of course, quite possible that it may recur. In addition to this flotsam, which is found in large masses in every big city, the militia which I mentioned consists of many adherents of an international European republic. I have been told the figures with which the foreign nations are there represented, but I remember only that almost 8,000 Englishmen are said to be in Paris for the sake of the realisation of their plans. I assume that these so-called Englishmen are largely Irish Fenians. And then there are many Belgians, Poles, 
adherents of Garibaldi and Italians. They are people who do not really care much for the Commune and French liberty. They expect something else, and they were, of course, not meant when I said there is a grain of sense in every movement. The needs and wishes of the large French communities are thoroughly justified, considering not only their own political past, which grants them a very moderate amount of freedom, but also the tradition of the French statesmen, who are offering to the cities their very best possible compromise with municipal freedom. The inhabitants of Alsace and Lorraine have felt these needs more forcefully, owing to their German character, which is stronger than the French character in its demands for individual and municipal independence. Personally, I am convinced that we can grant the people of Alsace and Lorraine at the very start a freer scope in self-government without endangering the empire as a whole. Gradually, this will be broadened until it approaches the ideal when every individual and every community possesses as much freedom as is at all compatible with the order of the state as a whole. I consider it the duty of reasonable statesmen to try to reach this goal, or to come as near to it as possible, and this is much easier with our present German institutions than it will ever be in France with the French character and the French centralised system of government. I believe, therefore, that, with German patience and benevolence, we shall succeed in winning the men of Alsace and Lorraine, perhaps in a briefer space of time than people today expect. But there will always be some residuary elements rooted with every personal memory in France, and too old to be transplanted, or necessarily connected with France by material interests. For them, there will be no compensation for the broken French bonds, or at least none for some time to come. We must, therefore, not permit ourselves to believe that the goal is in sight, and that Alsace will soon be as intensely German in feeling as Thuringia. On the other hand, we need not give up the hope of living to see the realisation of our plans, provided we fulfil the time generally allotted to men. The problem of how to approach this task, gentlemen, will now primarily concern you. What should be the form of our immediate procedure? For it should surely not bind us irrevocably for all the future. I would ask you not to deliberate as if you were to create something that will hold good for eternity. Do not endeavour to form a definite idea of the future, as you may think it should be after the lapse of several decades. No man's foresight, I hold, can reach as far as that. The conditions are abnormal. They had to be so. Our entire task was so, not only as regards the mode of taking possession of Alsace, but also as regards the present owners. An alliance of sovereign princes and free cities, making a conquest which it is compelled to keep for its own protection, and which is, therefore, held in joint possession is very rare in history. It is, in fact, I believe, unique, if we disregard a few ventures by some Swiss cantons, which, after all, did not intend to assimilate the countries which they had jointly conquered, but rather to manage them as common provinces in the interest of the conquerors. Considering, therefore, the abnormal conditions and our abnormal task, we are most especially called upon to guard against overestimating the perspicacity in human affairs of even the most far-sighted politicians. I, for one, do not feel capable of foretelling with certainty what the conditions in Alsace-Lorraine will be three years hence. To do this one would need an eye capable of piercing the future. Everything depends on factors whose development, conduct, and goodwill are beyond our power of regulation. What we are proposing to you is merely an attempt to find the right beginning of a road, 
the end of which we shall know only when we have been taught the necessary lessons by actual experience with the conditions of the future. Let me ask you, therefore, to follow at first the same empirical road which the governments have followed, and to take conditions as they are, and not as we may wish they should be. If one has nothing better to put in the place of something that one does not entirely like, one had better, I believe, let matters take their own course, and rest satisfied at first with conditions as they are. As a matter of fact, the Allied governments have jointly taken these countries, while their common possession and common administration, although constituting an established premise, may be modified in future by our own necessities and the needs of the people of Alsace and Lorraine. As regards the definite form which the proposition may take some day, I sincerely urge you to follow the lead of the governments and to defer your judgment. If you are bolder than we are in prejudging what will happen, we shall gladly meet your wishes, since we must work together. The caution with which I have announced to you the convictions of the Allied governments, and with which these governments have formed their convictions, is an indication to you of our willingness to be set right, if you should offer us a better plan, especially if experience, even a short experience, should have proved it to be a better plan. When I announce to you our willingness to work hand in hand with you, you are, I am sure, equally ready to join us in exercising German patience and German love toward all, and especially toward our new countrymen, and in endeavouring to discover, and finally to reach, the right goal. End of section 3. Read by Alistair, Melbourne. 24th of March, 2023. Section 4 of Speeches of Prince Bismarck, Part 1, by Otto von Bismarck, translated by Edmund von Mark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. We shall never go to Canosa, May 14th, 1872. Translated by Edmund von Mack, Ph.D. Early in 1872, the German government tried to bring about a peaceful understanding with the Ultramontane, i.e. Catholic party, by courteous advances made to the Pope. The Cardinal Prince Hohenlohe Schillingsfürst was designated as ambassador to His Holiness the Pope, who was asked whether the Prince would be acceptable. The Pope replied in the negative, and thereby deeply hurt the Emperor. When the expenses of this post in the budget were under discussion in the Reichstag, Mr. von Benningsen expressed the hope that they would be struck from the budget in future, to which Bismarck replied as follows, I can readily understand how the idea may arise that the expenses for this embassy have become unnecessary, because there is no longer a question here of protecting German subjects in those parts. I am, nevertheless, glad that no motion has been made to abolish this position, for it would have been unwelcome to the government. The duties of an embassy are, in part, it is true, the protection of its countrymen, but in part also, the mediation of political relations which the government of the empire happens to maintain with the court, where the ambassador is accredited. There is no foreign sovereign, authorised by the present state of our legislation, to exercise as extensive rights within the German empire as the Pope. While these rights are almost those of a sovereign, they are not guarded by any constitutional responsibility. Considerable importance, therefore, attaches to the kind of diplomatic relations which the German Empire is able to maintain with the head of the Roman Church, who exerts such a remarkably strong and, for a foreign sovereign, unusual influence among us. 
considering the prevailing tendencies of the Catholic Church at the present time, I scarcely believe that any ambassador of the German Empire would succeed in inducing His Holiness the Pope, by the most skilful diplomacy and by persuasion, to modify the position which he has taken on principle in all secular affairs. There can, of course, be no question here of forceful actions such as may occur between two secular powers. In view of the recently promulgated doctrines of the Catholic Church, I deem it impossible for any secular power to reach a concordat without effacing itself to a degree, and in a way which, to the German Empire at least, is unacceptable. You need not be afraid. We shall never go to Canossa, either actually or in spirit. Nevertheless, I cannot deny that the position of the Empire, as regards its religious peace, is somewhat shaken. It is not my duty here to investigate motives, or to ask which one of the two parties is at fault, but to defend an item of the budget. The united governments of the German Empire are searching, eagerly, and, in justice to their Catholic and their evangelical subjects, diligently for means which will secure a more agreeable state of affairs than the present, and which we will do so as peacefully as possible, and without unnecessarily disturbing the religious relations of the empire. I doubt whether this can be done except for by legislation, I mean general and national legislation, for which the governments will have to ask for the assistance of the Reichstag. But you will agree with me that this legislation should proceed with great moderation and delicacy, with due regard for everyone's freedom of conscience. The governments must be careful to avoid anything which will render their task more difficult, such as errors of information or ignorance of the proper forms, and must strive to readjust their internal peace with tender regard for religious sensibilities, even those which are not shared by all. In this connection it is, of course, necessary that the Holy See should be at all times well informed of the intentions of the German governments, certainly more so than it has been the case heretofore. One of the chief causes of the present disturbance in religious matters is, I believe, the misinformation which has reached His Holiness the Pope concerning the conditions in Germany and the intentions of the German governments and which has been due either to excitement or to the wrong colour given it by evil motives. I had hoped that the choice of an ambassador who possessed the full confidence of both parties would be welcome in Rome, of a man who loves truth and deserves confidence, and whose character and bearing are conciliatory. In short, of a man like the well-known prince of the church, whom his majesty the emperor had appointed to this post. I had hoped that this choice would be regarded as a pledge of our peaceful attitude and willingness to make advances, and would serve as a bridge to our mutual understanding. I had hoped that it would give the assurance that we should never ask anything of his holiness the pope but what a prince of the church allied to him by the most intimate ties, could present and convey to him, and that the forms would always be in keeping with those who characterise the intercourse of one prince of the church with another. This would have avoided all unnecessary friction in a case which is difficult enough. Many fears were expressed both by the Protestants and the liberals concerning this appointment, based, I believe, on an erroneous interpretation of the position of an envoy or ambassador. 
An ambassador, really, is a vessel which reaches its full value only when it is filled with the instructions of its master. In such delicate matters as these, however, it is desirable that the vessel should be agreeable and acceptable, and that it should be incapable of containing poisons or potions without immediately revealing them, as people used to say of ancient crystals. Unfortunately, and for reasons which have not yet been given, these intentions of the imperial government could not be carried out, because they were met with a curt refusal on the part of the Holy See. I can truly say that such a case does not often happen. When a sovereign has made his choice of an ambassador, it is customary for him to inquire from courtesy whether the ambassador will be persona grata with the sovereign to whom he will be accredited. But the receipt of a negative reply is most unusual, for it necessitates the repeal of an appointment already made. What the emperor can do toward the appointment, he does before asking the question. In other words, he has made the appointment before he asks the question. The negative reply, therefore, is a demand that a step, once taken, shall be repealed, a declaration which says, you have made a wrong choice. I have been foreign minister for about ten years, and have been engaged in questions of higher diplomacy for twenty-one years, and I am not mistaken, I believe, when I say that this is the first and only case in my experience where such a question has been answered in the negative. I have known more than once of doubts expressed concerning ambassadors who had served for some time, and of courts confidentially conveying their wish that a change be made in the person accredited to them. In every case, however, the court had had the experience of diplomatic relations with the particular person through several years, and was convinced that he was not qualified to safeguard good relations which it wished to maintain with us. It explained, therefore, in a most confidential and delicate way, generally by means of an autograph letter from one sovereign to the other, why it had taken this step. Such requests are rarely, if ever, made unconditionally. In recent times, as you know, a few cases have occurred, one of which at least was a very flagrant one, when the recall of an ambassador was demanded. But, as I have said, I do not remember another instance where an ambassador was refused when he was to be newly appointed. My regrets at this refusal are exceedingly keen, but I am not justified in translating these regrets into a feeling of vexation, for in justice to our Catholic fellow citizens, the government should not relax its exhortations in trying to find ways and means of regulating the dividing line between the spiritual and secular powers. Such a division is absolutely necessary in the interest of our internal peace, and it should be brought about in the most delicate manner, and in a way which will give the least offence to either confession. I shall therefore not be discouraged by what has happened but shall continue to use my influence with His Majesty the Emperor to the end that a representative of the Empire may be found for Rome, who enjoys the confidence of both powers, if not in equal measure, at least in measure sufficient for his duties. I cannot, of course, deny that our task has been rendered decidedly more difficult by what has happened.
End of section four. Read by Alistair. Melbourne, 26th of February, 2023. Section 5 of Speeches of Prince Bismarck, Part 1, by Otto von Bismarck, translated by Edmund von Mark. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bismarck as the Honest Broker, February 19th, 1878, translated by Edmund von Mark, PhD. The complete victory which Russia had won in the Turkish War had greatly disturbed the European powers and in Germany much apprehension was felt for the safety of Austria. England, too, was much concerned, for she had been displeased at Bismarck's refusal to intervene in the war. German public opinion was aroused, and the representative von Benningsen joined with four colleagues in the following interpolation, which they made in the Reichstag on February 8th. Is the Chancellor willing to inform the Reichstag of the political situation in the Orient, and the position which the German Empire has taken, or intends to take, in regard to it. The interpolation was put on the calendar of February 19th, and while Bismarck regarded it as ill-timed, he was ready to reply, lest his silence be misunderstood. I first ask the indulgence of the Reichstag, if I should not be able to stand, while I say everything I have to say. I am not so well as I look. With regard to the question, I cannot deny that I was in doubt when I first saw the interpolation, not whether I would answer it, for its form gives me the right to answer it with a no, but whether I should not have to say no. Do not assume, gentlemen, as one generally does in such cases, that the reason was because I had to suppress a good deal which would compromise our policy or restrict it in an undesirable manner. On the contrary, I have hardly enough to say in addition to what is already generally known to induce me, of my own initiative, to make a statement to the representatives of the Empire. The discussions in the English Parliament have almost exhaustively answered one part of the question. What is the political situation in the Orient at the present time? If... In spite of the paucity of information with which I am addressing you, I do not say no. It is because I fear the inference, that I have much to suppress, and because such an inference is always disquieting, especially when it is coupled with the desire to make capital out of my silence. I am the more pleased to address you with complete frankness, because the interpolation and the way it was introduced have given me the impression that if the German policy wishes to correspond to the majority opinion of the Reichstag, in so far as I may consider the recent comments an expression of this opinion, it has only to continue along the path which it has thus far followed. Regarding the present situation, I suspect that you already know everything I can say about it. You know from the press and the English parliamentary debates that at present one can say in the Orient, the arms are idle, and the storms of war are hushed, God grant for a long while. The armistice which has been concluded grants the Russian army an unbroken position from the Danube to the Sea of Mamara, with a base it lacked formerly. I mean the fortresses near the Danube. This fact, which is nowhere denied, seems to me to be the most important of the whole armistice. There is, excluded from the Russian occupation, if I may begin in the north, a quadrangular piece with Varna and Shamla extending along the shore of the Black Sea to Batshila in the north, and not quite to the Bay of Burgers in the south, thence inland to about Razgrad. A pretty exact quadrangle. Constantinople and the peninsula of Gallipoli are also excluded, the very two points on whose independence of Russia several interested powers are laying much stress. 
certain peace preliminaries preceded the armistice, which, at the risk of telling you things you already know, I shall nevertheless review, because they will answer the question whether German interests are at stake in any one of them. There is, in the first place, the establishment of Bulgaria, within the limits determined by the majority of the Bulgarian population, and not smaller than indicated by the Conference of Constantinople. The difference between these two designations is not of sufficient importance, I believe, to constitute a reasonable danger to the peace of Europe. The ethnographical information which we possess is, it is true, not authentic, nor without gaps, and the best we know has been supplied by Germans in the maps by Kiepert. According to this, the national frontier, the frontier of the Bulgarian nationality, runs down in the west, just beyond Salonika, along a line where the races are rather unmixed, and in the east, with an increased admixture of Turkish elements in the direction of the Black Sea. The frontier of the conference, on the other hand, so far as it is possible to trace it, runs, beginning at the sea, considerably farther north than the national frontier, and two separate Bulgarian provinces are contemplated. In the west, it reaches somewhat farther than the national frontier, into the districts which have an admixture of Albanian races. The constitution of Bulgaria, according to the preliminaries, would be similar to that of Serbia before the evacuation of Belgrade and other strongholds. For this first paragraph of the preliminaries closes with these words. The Ottoman army will not remain there, and in parenthesis, barring a few places subject to mutual agreement. It will, therefore, devolve upon the powers who signed the Paris Treaty of 1856 to discuss and define those sentences which were left open and indefinite there, and to come to an agreement with Russia, if this is possible, as I hope it may be. Then there follow the independence of Montenegro, also of Romania and Serbia, and directions concerning Bosnia and Herzegovina, whose reforms should be analogous. None of these things, I am convinced, touches the interests of Germany to such an extent that we should be justified in jeopardising for its sake our relations with our neighbours, our friends. We may accept one or the other definition without loss in our spheres of interest. Then there follows, under paragraph 5, a stipulation concerning the indemnity of war, which leaves the question open whether it should be pecuniary or territorial. This is a matter which concerns the belligerents insofar as it may be pecuniary, and the signers of the Paris Treaty of Peace insofar as it may be territorial, and will have to be settled by their consent. Then there follows the provision concerning the Dardanelles. This, I believe, has given cause for much more anxiety in the world than is justified by the actual possibilities of any probable outcome. His Majesty the Sultan declares his willingness to come to an agreement with His Majesty the Emperor of Russia with the view of safeguarding the rights and interests of Russia in the Straits of the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles. The question of the Dardanelles is freighted with importance when it means placing the control there, the key of the Bosphorus, in other hands than heretofore, and deciding whether Russia shall be able to close and to open the Dardanelles at will. All other stipulations can have reference only in times of peace, for in the more important times of war, the question will always hinge on whether the possessor of the key to the Dardanelles is in alliance with, or dependent on, those living outside or inside of the Dardanelles, on Russia, or on the opponents of Russia. In the case of war, I believe no stipulation which may be made will have the importance which people fear.
provided the Dardanelles are in times of peace in the possession of people who are fully independent of Russia. It may be of interest for the people on the shores of the Mediterranean to know whether the Russian Black Sea fleet shall be permitted in times of peace to sail through the Dardanelles and to show itself on their shores. If, however, it shows itself there, I should infer peace, like good weather from the barometer. When it withdraws and carefully secludes itself, then it is time to suspect that clouds are gathering. The question, therefore, whether men of war shall be permitted to pass the Dardanelles in times of peace, although by no means unimportant, is to my way of thinking not sufficiently important to inflame Europe. The question whether the possession of the Dardanelles shall be shifted over to other owners is entirely different. It constitutes, however, a conjectural eventuality which the present situation does not contemplate, I believe, and on which I shall, therefore, express no opinion. My only concern at present is to give an approximate definition, as best I can, of those weighty interests which may lead to another war after the Russian-Turkish war has been actually concluded. For this reason, I deem it important to affirm that the stipulation of peace concerning the Dardanelles mean less for the men of war than for the merchant marine. The preeminent German interest in the Orient demands that the waterways, the Straits as well as the Danube, from the Black Sea upward, shall continue as free and open to us as they have been until now. I rather infer that we shall surely obtain this for as a matter of fact, it has never even been questioned. An official communication on this point, which I have received from St. Petersburg, simply refers to the existing stipulations of the Treaty of Paris. Nothing is jeopardized, our position can be no worse and no better than it has been. The interest which we have in a better government of a Christian nation and in the safeguards against those acts of violence which have occurred at times under Turkish rule, is taken care of by the agreements mentioned above. And this is the second interest which Germany has in this whole affair. It is less direct, but is dictated by humanity. The rest of the preliminary stipulations consists, I will not say of phrases, for it is an official paper, but it has no bearing on our present discussion. With these explanations, I have answered to the best of my ability the first part of the interpolation concerning the present state of affairs in the Orient, and I fear, gentlemen, that I have said nothing new to any one of you. The other parts of the question refer to the position which Germany has taken, or intends to take, in view of the now existing conditions and innovations. As to the position which we have already taken, I cannot now give you any information, for officially we have only been in possession of the papers to which I have referred only a very short while. I may say literally only since this very morning. What we knew beforehand was in general agreement with these papers, but not of a nature to make official steps possible. It consisted of private communications for which we were indebted to the courtesy of other governments. Official steps, therefore, have not yet been taken, and would be premature in view of the conference, which I hope is at hand. All this information will then be available, and we shall be in a position to exchange opinions concerning these matters. Any alterations, therefore, of the stipulations of 1856 will have to be sanctioned. If they should not be, the result would not necessarily be another war. But a condition of affairs which all the powers of Europe, I think, have good cause to avoid. I am almost tempted to call it making a morass of matters. Let us assume that no agreement about what has to be done can be reached in the conference, 
and that the powers who have a chief interest in opposing the Russian stipulations should say, at the present moment it does not suit us to go to war about these questions, but we are not in accord with your agreements and we reserve our decision. Would not that establish a condition of affairs which cannot be agreeable even to Russia? The Russian policy rightly states, we are not desirous of exposing ourselves to the necessity of a Turkish campaign every ten or twenty years, for it is exhausting, strenuous, and expensive. But the Russian policy, on the other hand, cannot wish to substitute for this Turkish danger an English-Austrian entanglement recurring every ten or twenty years. It is, therefore, my opinion that Russia is equally interested with the other powers in reaching an agreement now, and in not deferring it to some future and perhaps less convenient time. That Russia could possibly wish to force the other powers, by war, to sanction the changes which she deems necessary, I consider beyond the realm of probability. If she could not obtain the sanction of the other signers of the clauses of 1856, she would, I suppose, be satisfied with the thought, Beati possidentes. Happy are the possessors. Then the question would arise whether those who are dissatisfied with the Russian agreements and have real and material interests at stake would be ready to wage war in order to force Russia to diminish her demands or to give up some of them. If they should be successful in forcing Russia to give up more than she could bear, they would do so at the risk of leaving in Russia, when the troops come home, a feeling similar to that in Prussia after the treaties of 1815, a lingering feeling that matters really are not settled, and that another attempt will have to be made. If this could be achieved by a war, one would have to regard, as the aim of this war, the expulsion of Russia from the Bulgarian stronghold which she is at present occupying, and from her position which is no doubt threatened in Constantinople, although she has given no indication of a wish to occupy the city. Those who would have accomplished this by a victorious war would then have to shoulder the responsibility of deciding what should be done with these countries of European Turkey, that they should be willing simply to reinstate the Turkish rule in its entirety, after everything said and determined in the conference, is, I believe, very improbable. They would, therefore, be obliged to make some kind of a disposition which could not differ very much in principle from what is being proposed now. It might differ in geographical extent, and in the degree of independence, but I do not believe that Austria-Hungary, for instance, the nearest neighbour, would be ready to accept the entire heritage of the present Russian conquest and be responsible for the future of these Slavic countries, either by incorporating them in the state of Hungary, or establishing them as dependencies. I do not believe that this is an end which Austria can much desire in view of her own Slavic subjects. She cannot wish to be the editor of the future in the Balkan Peninsula, as she would have to be if she won a victory. I mention all these eventualities, in which I place no faith, for the sake of proving how slight the reasonable probability of a European war appears to be. It is not reasonably probable that the greater or lesser extent of a tributary state, unless conditions were altogether unbearable, should induce two neighbouring and friendly powers to start a destructive European war in cold blood. The blood will be cooler, I assure you, when we have at last come together in a conference. It was to meet these eventualities that the idea of a conference was first proposed by the government of Austria-Hungary. We were, from the start, ready to accept it, and were almost the first to do so. 
concerning the selection of a place where the conference should be held, difficulties arose which I consider out of proportion to the significance of the whole matter. But, even in this direction, we have raised no objections, and declared ourselves satisfied with the places which have been mentioned. They are Vienna, Brussels, Baden-Baden, Wiesbaden, Wildbad, a place in Switzerland. I should, however, say Wildbad was mentioned by no one but itself. Stuttgart was also mentioned. Any of these places would have been agreeable to us. It now seems, if I am correctly informed, and the decision must be made in a few days, that the choice will fall on Baden-Baden. Our interest, which is shared by those powers with whom we have corresponded, is the dispatch of the conference irrespective of the choice of a place, which is for us of little consequence. As regards places in Germany, I have expressed no opinion beyond this, that on German soil the presidency would have to be German. This view has nowhere been opposed. After the general acceptance of this principle, it will depend on the men sent to attend this conference, whether for reasons of expediency it must be adhered to. Personally, I believe the conference is assured, and I expect that it will take place in the first half of next March. It would be desirable that the conference should take place sooner, and the uncertainty concerning it be ended. But before the powers join in a conference, they naturally desire an exchange of opinion, the one with the other, and the connections with the seat of war are really very slow. The delay of the communications which reached us was, and still is, explained by the delay with which news comes from the seat of war. The suspicion which has for some time been felt in the press that this delay was intentional becomes unfounded when one realises that the advance of the Russian army following January 30th was in consequence of the stipulations of the armistice and did not constitute an advantage taken of an opportune moment. The boundaries within which the Russian army is stationed today are the lines of demarcation expressly mentioned in the armistice. I do not believe in any intentional delay from anywhere. On the contrary, I have confidence in the good intentions everywhere to send representatives to the conference speedily. We certainly shall do our part to the best of our ability. I now come to the most difficult part. Excuse me if I continue for the present seated. I come to the most difficult part of the task set me, an explanation, so far as is possible, of the position which Germany is to take in the conference. In this connection you will not expect from me anything but general indications of our policy. Its programme, Mr. von Benningsen, has developed before you clearly and comprehensively, almost more so than my strength at the present moment permits me to do. When, from many quarters, the demand has been made upon us, to be sure from no government, but only from voices in the press and other well-meaning advisers, that we should define our policy from the start and force it on the other governments in some form, I must say this seems to me to be newspaper diplomacy rather than the diplomacy of a statesman. Let me explain to you at once the difficulty and impossibility of such a course. If we did express a definite programme which we should be obliged to follow when we had announced it officially and openly, not only before you, but also the whole of Europe, should we not then place a premium on the contentiousness of all those who considered our programme to be not favourable to themselves? 
we should also render the part of mediation in the conference, which I deem very important, almost impossible for ourselves, because everybody with the menu of the German policy in his hand could say to us, German mediation can go just so far, it can do this, and this it cannot do. It is quite possible that the free hand which Germany has preserved, and the uncertainty of Germany's decisions, have not been without influence on the preservation of peace thus far. If you play the German card, laying it on the table, everybody knows how to adapt himself to it, or how to avoid it. Such a course is impracticable if you wish to preserve peace. The adjustment of peace does not, I believe, consist in our playing the arbiter, saying, it must be thus, and the weight of the German Empire stands behind it. Peace is brought about, I think, more modestly. Without straining the simile which I am quoting from our everyday life, it partakes more of the behaviour of the honest broker, who really wishes to bring about a bargain. As long as we follow this policy, we are in the position to save a power which has secret wishes from the embarrassment of meeting with a refusal or an unpleasant reply from its, let's say, congressional opponent. If we are equally friendly with both, we can first sound one, and then say to the other, Do not do that. Try to arrange matters in this way. These are helps in business which should be highly esteemed. I have an experience of many years in such matters, and it has been brought home to me often that when two are alone, the thread drops more frequently, and it is not picked up because of false shame. The moment when it could be picked up passes. People separate in silence and are annoyed. If, however, a third person is present, he can pick up the thread without much ado and bring the two together again when they have parted. This is the function of which I am thinking and which corresponds to the amicable relations in which we are living with our friendly neighbours along our extensive borders. It is, moreover, in keeping with the union among the three imperial courts which has existed for five years, and the intimacy which we enjoy with England, another one of the powers chiefly concerned in this matter. As regards England, we are in the fortunate position of not having any conflicting interests, except, perhaps, some trade rivalries or passing annoyances. These latter cannot be avoided, but there is absolutely nothing which could drive two industrious and peace-loving nations to war. I happily believe, therefore, that we may be the mediator between England and Russia, just as I know we are between Austria and Russia, if they should not be able to agree of their own accord. The Three Emperor Pact, if one wishes to call it such, while it is generally called a treaty, it is not based on any written obligations, and no one of the three emperors can be voted down by the other two. It is based on the personal sympathy among the three rulers, on the personal confidence which they have in one another, and on the personal relations which, for many years, have existed among the leading ministers of all three empires. We have always avoided forming a majority of two against one when there was a difference of opinion between Austria and Russia and we have never definitely taken the part of one of them, even if our own desires drew us more strongly in that direction. We have refrained from this, for fear that the tie might not be sufficiently strong after all. It surely cannot be so strong 
that it could induce one of these great powers to disregard its own incontestable national interests for the sake of being obliging. That is a sacrifice which no great power makes pour les bourgeois of another. Such a sacrifice it makes only when arguments are replaced by hints of strength. Then it may happen that the great power will say, I hate to make this concession, but I hate even worse to go to war with so strong a power as Germany. Still, I will remember this and make note of it. That is about the way in which such things are received. And this leads me to the necessity of vigorously opposing all exaggerated demands made on Germany's mediation. Let me declare that they are out of the question so long as I have the honour of being the adviser of his majesty. I know that in saying this I am disappointing a great many expectations raised in connection with today's disclosures, but I am not of the opinion that we should go the road of Napoleon and try to be, if not the arbiter, at least the schoolmaster of Europe. I have here a clipping given me today from the Allgemeine Zeitung, which contains a noteworthy article entitled The Policy of Germany in the Decisive Hour. This article demands as necessary the admission of a third power to the alliance of England and Austria. That means we shall take part with England and Austria and deprive Russia of the credit of voluntarily making concessions which she may be willing to grant in the interest of European peace. I do not doubt that Russia will sacrifice for the sake of peace in Europe. Whatever her sense of nationality and her own interests and those of 80 million Russians permit, it is really superfluous to say this. And now, please assume that we took the advice of the gentleman who think that we should play the part of an arbiter. I have here another article from a Berlin paper called Germany's Part as Arbiter, and that we declared to Russia in some polite and amicable way. We have been friends, it is true, for hundreds of years. Russia has ever been true blue to us when we were in difficulties, but now things are different. In the interest of Europe, as the policeman of Europe, as a kind of justice of the peace, we must do as we are requested. We can no longer resist the demands of Europe. What would be the result? There are considerable numbers of Russians who do not love Germany, and who fortunately are not at the helm now, but who would not be unhappy if they were called there. What would they say to their compatriots? They, and perhaps other statesmen, who at present are not yet avowedly hostile to us, they would say, With what sacrifices of blood and men and money have we not won the position which for centuries has been the ideal of Russian ambition? We could have maintained it against those opponents who may have a real interest in combating it. It was not Austria with whom we have lived on moderately intimate terms for some time. It was not England who possesses openly acknowledged counter-interests to ours. No, it was our intimate friend Germany who drew behind our back not her sword but a dagger. Although we might have expected from her services in return for services rendered and although she has no interests in the Orient. Those, approximately, would be the phrases, and this is the theme, which we should hear in Russia. This picture, which I have drawn in exaggerated lines, but the Russian orators also exaggerate, corresponds with the truth. We, however, shall never assume the responsibility of sacrificing the certain friendship of a great nation tested through generations to the momentary temptation of playing the judge in Europe to jeopardise the friendship which fortunately binds us to most European states, and at the present moment to all, for the parties to whom it is an eyesore are not in power, 
to jeopardise, I say, this friendship with one friend in order to oblige another, when we as Germans have no direct interests, and to buy the peace of the others at the cost of our own, or to speak with college boys, to substitute at a duel. Such things one may do when one risks only one's own life, but I cannot do them when I have to counsel His Majesty the Emperor as regards the policy of a great state of forty million people in the heart of Europe. From this tribune I therefore take the liberty of saying a very definite no to all such imputations and suggestions. I shall under no condition do anything of the kind, and no government, none of those primarily interested, has made any such demands. Germany, as the last speaker remarked, has grown to new responsibilities as it has grown stronger. But even if we are able to throw a large armed force into the scales of European policies, I do not consider anybody justified in advising the Emperor and the Princes, who would have to discuss the matter in the Bundesrat if we wish to wage an offensive war, to make an appeal to the proven readiness of the nation to offer blood and money for a war. The only war which I am ready to counsel the Emperor is one to protect our independence abroad and our union at home, or to defend those of our interests which are so clear that we are supported if we insist on them, not only by the unanimous vote of the Bundesrat, which is necessary, but also the undivided enthusiasm of the whole German nation. End of section 5 End of Speeches of Prince Bismarck, Part 1 By Otto von Bismarck Translated by Edmund von Mach